are going to have that song a little bit later. But um, it was good listening to that being played. We usually have our time of prayer just before the service, and uh, we didn't do that this morning. So how about we just start uh, with some prayer that maybe if you'd like to pray for something this morning as we begin the this, this service, if there's something you'd like to to uh, pray, uh, I'll begin and we'll have Pastor Lindsay finish in prayer, but if anybody would like to, to pray as well. Heavenly Father, we thank you for this day. We thank you, Lord, for a day of rest and worship. And Lord, for some of us, it's not um, always very restful because of what we uh, have to do, but Lord, help us to have rest to our spirits today and help us, Lord, to be able to also find time to rest our bodies and our minds and, and to, to be able to be refreshed for the week ahead. We pray, Lord, that you would speak to us through your word today. Say what you would like to say to each one of us, we pray. Thank you for each one that is here. Be with those on their way. We ask in Jesus' name. Amen. Heavenly Father, I just want uh, to lift you up today and what you tonight. This is a, 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 the journey for uh, Don and Sherry Floyd. They are missionaries up in PNG. Now, if I can't pronounce some of these words. <laughs> Truly I tell you, if you have faith as small as a mustard seed, you can say this to the mountain. Move from here to there and it will move. Nothing will be impossible for you. That's found in Matthew 20 verse 7. When considering long-term missionary service, it's likely that anyone can be intimidated by the thought of the next 10 years plus. A lot can happen in a chunk of time. Just one small faithful step at a time. Even faith, as small as a mustard seed, can bring missionaries to a place of fruitful reflection. For global partners, missionaries Sherry and Don Floyd, it has been the small, faithful steps that have brought them to their current stage of life, serving in Papua New Guinea. From small beginnings to just six weeks into marriage, to experience the faithfulness of God's time, and time again as they prepared to send their youngest son off to college about 30 years later. Their story demonstrates a deep understanding of this mission that matters, a love for the PNG friends and community and a commitment to what God had called them to do. Both Don and Sherry grew up around mission-minded people and felt called early on. Sherry's journey into a long-term missionary service took flight during the summer cross culture into internship in PNG, where she experienced a miraculous confirmation. I pray on a Monday that God would open my ears to hear what people were saying in talk Tyson. That would open my mouth to start to say the words, and by that Sunday, I could hear and speak the language she encountered. Sir Don grew up in Australia. His grandmother serves as a missionary in Tonga, and his mother served as a missionary nurse in PNG. And his parents met in PNG when he began working as a carpenter and heard of work teams that went on mission trips. He decided to participate in one, which led to two teams that went on a mission trip. He decided to participate and extend more visits, one of which where he met and worked alongside Sherry. Eventually, after some long distance dating, the two got married and returned to PNG full time a mere six weeks later. The two of them began their ministry as lay missionaries and have stepped into a variety of roles as time progressed. For a while, Sherry dedicated a lot of her time to the education of their three sons and provided health and literacy education for women in PNG. Five or six years ago, as a tradition to become Esti empty nesters rapid approached, she said she heard God start to speak to her about completing a course she needed for ordination. 
Along with completing these necessary courses, she also obtained a Master in Adult Education and is now working at the, Minister at the Wesleyan Bible College at PNG. At the college invitation, additionally, she began her journey as the Pacific Southeast Asian Region Director nearly one year ago. As she had stepped into leadership within PNG, she said the transition had gone smoothly. Wonder how it would have been because they know me for a long time. They think of me as their kid because they knew me before I was married, she explained. I also am well aware of the women being second class citizens in this culture and I wonder how that would be too. The male leadership has been very affirming and willing to work with me. The notes of the genuine respect male leaders have had for her as a result of working built deep relationships for years. Don's journey began at the maintenance guide. He had led him to teach practical classes such as computer skills, building and carpentry classes at the college. He often, sometimes, when Bible college students are graduated and returned to their homes, Dora districts, as a pastor, their churches often look to them as the experts, equipping them with the practical skills in addition to pastoral training prepared for them for life after college building a church, maintaining the building, helping congregations with their needs, and so on. Don has been working with PNG leadership for a long time, and is all about empowering them and setting them up to look good, Sherry added. Through this role have changed and evolved over time. They credit this to the importance of knowing when to hand off things to other people. To be honest, if you're doing the same thing after 30 years, you may have not been handling things over like you should or training people, Don said. Empowering and equipping local leaderships to both essential and powerful, this change of seasons, along with the fact that there are 850 people groups and languages in PNG. Also, what keeps ministries interesting and exciting as the Floyds have continued to build resilience and a desire to stay on the field. But it didn't happen overnight. Sherry said she remembered Don writing her letters during their season of long distance dating. He wrote about a chapel speaker who said, if God calls you to be a pastor or missionary, it's for life. Sherry recounted Don was saying, I don't know, I just know that God is calling me right now. And as long as they feel that call at the end of each year of serving in PNG, they will plan to continue to serve. Taking it all a faithful step at the time was also just plain necessary. Would have been scared spitless if you told me 30 years ago that as this is what I will be doing. Don said to them with a laugh. When Sherry and Don entered into ministry work, they had said they had a lot of long-term missionary settings great examples. We were kind of in the tail end of the era of missions where people did stay a long time. It was pretty common that it was your career, so we had some good examples, Sherry said. The families of who have been in PNG for years ahead of them gave advice that has stuck with them all these years too. They were told that although they will make friends with fellow missionaries, it's necessary to connect with local individuals. A fellow missionary told them, at the end of the day, missionaries come and missionaries go but the PNG would always be there. Invest most of your relationships with them. And he was right, Sherry said. Now they have a big church, family surrounding them. None of Sherry and Don's journeys would have been possible without remaining faithful and devoted to what God was calling them towards. They continue to grow, to learn, and to respond to the call God had placed on their lives. And there are so many exciting things yet to come. Python is a widely spoken language in PNG. Thank you. Hey John, one fourteen. The elder to the beloved Gaius, whom I love in truth. Beloved, I pray that you may prosper in all things and be in health, just as your soul prospers. For I rejoice greatly when brethren come and testify of the truth that is in you, just as you walk in truth. I have no greater joy than to hear 
that my children walk in truth. Beloved, you do faithfully whatever you do for the brethren and for strangers who have borne witness of your love before the church. If you send them forward on their journey in a manner worthy of God, you will do well because they went forth in his name's sake. Take nothing from the Gentiles, taking nothing from the Gentiles. We therefore ought to receive such that we may become fellow workers for the truth. I wrote to the church, but Diotrephus, or Diotrephes, who loves to have the preeminence among them, does not receive us. Therefore, if I come, I will call all to mind his deeds, which he does, prating against us with malicious words, and not content with that, he himself does not receive the brethren, and forbids those who wish to put them, who wish, who wish to, putting them out of the church. Beloved, do not imitate what is evil, but what is good. He who does good is of God, and he who does evil has not seen God. Demetrius has a good testimony from all, and from the truth itself. And we also bear witness, and you know that our testimony is true. I had many things to write, but I do not wish to write to you with pen and ink. But I hope to see you shortly, and we shall speak face to face. Peace to you, our friends. Peace to you, our friends greet you, and greet friends by name. Well, thank you, Ron, for reading the whole book of Third John. <laughs> and we'll need some ushers to open the double doors. Uh, somebody's just come. Today, before you begin the sermon, I'd like to pray. Our Heavenly Father, we pray that you would open our eyes and our ears to what the Scripture is about. Help us to understand how important it is to have good church relationship within the church itself. Speak to us from your word today. We ask in Jesus' name. Amen. The book of 3rd John, or the third book of John, John here is writing this letter to deal with a pastoral problem within the local church. This letter is written to the pastor about the matter. According to the Beacon Bible Commentary, the Apostle John was the superintendent. On those days they didn't call him superintendent, they called him the bishop. He had supervision and because he was the last of the original 12 disciples, he was held in great respect by the whole church. And so he had this role of being like a superintendent or a bishop. But I have three questions in this sermon. The first one is, who is Gaius? Quote the first verse, the elder to the beloved Gaius, whom I love in truth. So who is Gaius? Now I'll read some more verses from this chapter, verses 5 to 8. Beloved, you do faithfully whatever you do for the brethren and for the strangers who have borne witness of your love for the church. So he's describing the ministry of Gaius. If you send them forward on their journey in a manner worthy of God, you will do well. Because they went forth for his name's sake, taking nothing from the Gentiles. Now what does that mean? It means they didn't ask for financial support. We therefore ought to receive such that we may become fellow workers for the truth. So to explain what was happening here, Apparently some of the travelling Christian brethren, who were evangelists or missionaries, they had been to the town where Gaius lived and had brought word to John concerning this church. So they were travelling evangelists who had been to Gaius' church and had taken back word to John and given them a very good report. At this time there were travelling missionaries who went from place to place preaching the gospel. And it was the duty of the Christian people to house and feed these missionaries. That's according to the Wesleyan Bible commentary. As they stayed with them. So they showed them real Christian hospitality. So that's the setting of what's happening here. Peter encouraged also Christians to show hospitality. <coughs> Apostle Peter said in 1 Peter chapter 4 verse 9, Be hospitable to one another without grumbling. 
And then also in the book of Hebrews, it has something interesting to say about this in Hebrews 13, verse 2. Did not forget to entertain strangers, for by so doing some have unwittingly entertained angels. And then Paul said to uh, young Timothy, the pastor, in 1 Timothy 3, verse 2, a bishop or a superintendent must then be blameless, a husband of one wife, temperate, sober-minded, and of good behavior and hospitable and able to teach. Now, hospitality is part of the ministry of the bishop as well as fellow Christians. And then the Apostle Paul said, welcome Peter, and welcome Adriana. The Apostle Paul said to the Roman Christians in Romans 12 verse 13, that we should be distributing to the needs of the saints and given to hospitality. He said that to the whole church. So hospitality is what Christians should be doing, especially to traveling and visitors. So we can draw the conclusion from this passage of scripture that God calls some to be traveling evangelists and missionaries and some to be faithful supporters. For example, we were talking about Dr. Sherry Floyd this morning as missionaries in Papua New Guinea. God has called them to be missionaries and he's called us to be their supporters. But how else can they go and be sustained there? Although there are several men of this name Gaius in the New Testament, uh, this Gaius was probably, according to the Beacon Bible Commentary, was probably a young pastor stationed at one of the churches under the leadership of John. And so Apostle John is writing to one of the young pastors. He may possibly be the same man who is described by Paul in Romans 16.23 as the host of the whole church. That's only an educated guess because there are three, several, three or four Gaius mentioned in the New Testament from different places. So this Gaius Paul mentions in Romans 16 was showing hospitality to the Christian believers. But John commended this young pastor Gaius for his Christian love. He also prays that Gaius may prosper or be successful in everything he does. And he also prays for his health. You ever pray for the pastor's health? Or the missionary's health? They're human just like us and they need, need that prayer. John also commends him for, as a pastor for the good report he received from those traveling evangelists about him. And this is the good report that he received about him. The report said that in Gaius, the truth is in him. Sometimes it's possible for Christian leaders to speak words of truth, but the truth really isn't in their heart. It has to be in you. It's for you to be a fair income leader. The truth has to be in your heart and life and it certainly was in this young pastor. And it's also said he's walking in the truth. What does that mean? It means he's living in the truth. He lives every day according to the truth. And then this report also said that my children are also walking in truth. Now what is that talking about? Who, what children? The Apostle John as an older man in his 90s by this time uses the word children to refer to those who are immediately under his pastoral care. He's an old man and, and younger Christians are under his care. And as a term of affection, he calls them his children. And he's pleased and happy that they are walking in the truth. They also are living in the truth. So John was rejoicing over this good report that both Pastor Gaze and his people were living in the truth. And this good report was brought back to him by this traveling evangelist who had been to Gaius' church. He brought back good report to John. They were doing well. Then, so we talked about Gaius, but who is Diotrephes? It's a difficult name that both Warren and I have trouble saying. In this chapter, verses 9 to 10, it says, I wrote to the church, but died. Diotrephes, who loves to have the preeminence among them, does not receive us. 
Therefore, if I come, that's John saying this to Gaius, therefore, if I come, I will call to mind his deeds which he does. Now, I won't forget them. Prating against us with malicious words, and not content with that, he himself does not receive the brethren, that's the visiting, travelling visitors, and he forbids those who wish to receive them, putting them out of the church. That's what's going on. So according to the Beacon Bible Commentary, Diotrephes was a leading church member. Has that ever happened within churches that somebody has leadership and they misuse it? The Apostle John is aware of this, his unruly behaviour and describes his actions within the church. And they're pretty head on. He loves to have the preeminence among them. He is self-important in other words. Proud. He prattles against John with malicious words. He gets the superintendent, in other words. John was the bishop or the leader. With malicious words. And then he rejects the visiting evangelists and forbids those in the church who wish to receive them, even putting them who wish to receive them out of the church. I mean, that's pretty audacious to do such things. A leader should not be acting, that's not Christ-like behaviour. This behaviour shows how haughty he is and how arrogant. And John replies that if he comes, and later on in the book, at the close of the book, he said he's about to come. To visit this church, he would recall what Diotrephes had been doing. Now, recall not just to himself, but to the whole church. John then instructed the church people to only imitate what is good because that way, that way of living is from God. It says that in verse 11. And then there's a third name mentioned in the book, Demetrius. Now I had, I had some Greek friends whose name was Demetrius down in Sydney. It says about Demetrius, a very good report, Demetrius has a good testimony from all. Everyone in the church thinks highly of Demetrius. And he has a good testimony from the truth itself. And we also, John's saying this, we also bear witness, and you know that our testimony is true. Now what we'd say today, Demetrius is a jolly good bloke as a Christian. According to Dr. Adam Clark, the Bible commentator, Demetrius was possibly the bearer of this letter from John to Gaius. He thinks that Demetrius brought the letter that John had written to the, to the church. He brought it to them. Demetrius had a good testimony from all the Christians. He had a good testimony from the truth itself. So what's that referring to? The truth itself. Who said, I am the way, the truth, and the life? Yeah, Jesus. It's Jesus. He has a good testimony from Jesus. And he also has a good testimony from John. So come highly commended. And we as fellow Christians should also have a good testimony from fellow Christians who know and love us. So in conclusion, what can we say? This church to whom John was writing as their superintendent or bishop, was being well led by their young pastor Gaius. But they were having to deal with a troublemaking, arrogant church member who was forcing his way within the church. The reason why the Lord ordains pastors and superintendents, or bishops, as they used to call them, the reason why the Lord ordains leaders is to keep peace and truth and love within the church and to uh, hinder and stand against those who would cause trouble. And sometimes leaders have difficult things to do, but it's necessary. And to love, uh, keep love within the church and to shepherd the flock of God in a Christ-like way. And there are other instructions in the New Testament how leaders are to behave themselves. So we all, whether we're pastor, people or superintendent, should abide in the truth. We've been talking about that, living in the truth in Christ. Walking or living in the truth and being workers together for the truth. And we need to have a good testimony from the truth, from Christ himself.
in verses 3 to 4, John says, I rejoiced greatly when the brethren, the visiting missionaries, came and testified of the truth that is in you, just as you walk in the truth. I have no greater joy than to hear that my children walk in truth. Did you hear what John is saying through that? Who remembers Johnny Cash saying that? A song with those words in it. I rejoice that my children walk in truth. That's where the scripture comes from. So if we all truly have the love of Christ within us, we will be loving one another in a way that glorifies Christ. Now there are times in church life where problems happen and problem people can. we have to deal with, but we should still deal with it in a Christ-like way. So in this short letter, perhaps when you first read it, you didn't quite grasp what was happening. But I hope today you get the idea. But John was writing to young Gaius, the pastor, about a bloke that was causing trouble in church. And how they had to deal with it. And to imitate truth and not to uh, <coughs> imitate the good. I think he closes with the words, imitate what is good because that is glorifying to God. Don't be sidetracked into the advisor. So I hope we've learned some lessons there today that will be a blessing to us all. How to walk and live in truth. Let us pray. Our Heavenly Father, we thank you for this short letter that John wrote to Gaius, the young pastor, and the instructions he has in that. We pray that you'll help us to always live and walk in the truth and to always Keep close to you, Lord, so our attitudes and our spirit will be sweet like it should be. And help us, if we have to face conflict, to know how to handle it in the spirit of Christ. We pray in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Pastor Joe is going to come and lead us as we sing our final hymn, number 202. Take our hymn book and turn to 202.